thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. But I have the unfortunate task of starting with some bad news. And the bad news is that we're currently in what's known as the US absenteeism crisis. This is a crisis that is impacting students while they're in school and while they graduate and after they graduate in numerous ways. There's now causal evidence that being absent from school reduces achievement. It has higher odds of grade retention, reduces social development, has more disengagement among those students, higher odds of dropout, and so on and so on. In fact, the California Attorney General's Office to this last bullet point found that in one year, the school districts in California lost a billion dollars in revenue from those kids not being in their seats. So this is a major problem affecting not only the United States, but also here at home in California. The response has been positive from the policy and research side, so this is the good news. So the Attorney General, Kamala Harris, when she was Attorney General, had reports on the truancy and absenteeism crisis. States across the country are beginning to tackle this crisis from coast to coast. The University of Utah has an education policy center that focuses on chronic absenteeism. Departments of education are getting involved. Community players like Attendance Works, No Kid Hungry, are getting involved. The Obama administration had a multi-initiative through the US Department of Education, Health and Human Services, Department of Justice, all trying to engage schools, parents, teachers, families in reducing absenteeism. So as I said, the Attorney General said that truancy is at a crisis level right here in Santa Barbara, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco. And I had the pleasure of working with her. There's a very small cutout of her. And UC Santa Barbara highlighted in an article from the LA Times about the work that they had done engaging with her about how to find solutions that were scalable and replicable when it comes to reducing absenteeism in California and the United States. So the question is, why now? Why is there a focus on chronic absenteeism right now? Well, the first one is that we have a clear picture of chronic absenteeism now more than ever before in our nation's history. Part of the reason is that we simply have better and bigger data sets. And so what we know at this moment is that five to 7.5 million students are missing at least one month of school per year. That translates to about 150 to 250 million days of instructions that's lost among our students. There's also been a renewed policy focus, as you saw from the previous slide. So we see federal government getting involved. States, local, community players are all taking a role right now. So this is really important as we speak. And there's a new measure of accountability. In ESSA, E-S-S-A, the fifth measure of school performance can be how well is your school doing in terms of student absenteeism. And so 37 states and Washington, D.C. have adopted this fifth measure. But if we're going to measure school absences, if we're going to say this school is doing better in terms of absences than other schools, there are a lot of assumptions that we need to make. We need to assume that states and districts can accurately track attendance, that researchers can develop fair measures for how to, uh, how to assess attendance, and that states, districts, and schools can affect absenteeism. And so what we need to do right now is we need to figure out what we've learned, what we need to learn, but more importantly, the first step is what we need to unlearn about absenteeism. And that's what I wanted to focus on today. So there's a lot of myths about absenteeism, and I wanted to focus on five. The first one is that concerns about absenteeism are new. And in fact, this is false. Here's a quote from Horace Mann from 1839. I'm not going to read it. But what he talks about is we have really good measures of other things like people in the military, and yet we don't have good measures about people in school. And so what you can see from our early educational history is attendance records. So attendance is not a new thing that we're thinking about here in the US. It just happens to have a rebirth right now. The second thing is that measuring absences is easy. This is another myth. There's so much variation on absences. There's parental authorized versus student reported. I've done some work looking at excused versus unexcused. There's definitional issues. Chronic absenteeism doesn't mean the same thing from state to state to DC. In some states, it's 10% of the year. In some states, it's 5% of the year. In some states, it's 95% of the year. It's a mess. The third issue 
is that there's a myth that this is a really big problem among teens, that this is a Molly Ringwald movie, that kids are hiding behind the bleachers. This is simply not true. The facts about early childhood education are staggering. 50% of three to four year olds in Chicago miss 10% of preschool. 10% of kids in K-1 missed at least 10% of the year, making them chronically absent. And these early absences are important because they create inequalities. Absent preschoolers are less prepared for kindergarten, and these early absences tend to persist. Four, schools can easily address this crisis that is also false. So there are many issues beyond a school's control, right? So health, mobility, disability are all things that students come to school with. We can't expect schools to immediately address those issues. The relationships are complex between all of these issues as well as other issues. And so schools face limited resources and we're expanding program demands when we expect them to address absenteeism. Finally, parents know that absences are bad. This is also not true. So parents actually underestimate the effect of absences on kids' outcomes. This is often exacerbated in low socioeconomic status families. It might be a sign of parental disengagement. We're not sure. There's a lot of work we need to do on what parents know and don't know about absenteeism. Maybe it's about lack of school involvement. Maybe it's a lack of school outreach. And so to end this quick eight minutes, fast and furious, um, the myths dispelled. So those are the five myths. What can we do next? Can we actually identify students who are at risk? What are reasonable targets for schools? Is 90% a good target to have kids there every day? Should these targets based on the grades? Should we have different expectations for early childhood education versus kids in ninth grade? What measurement pitfalls arise and how might they impact research and policy making? Part two. What current and ongoing school specific settings and existing programs might be contributing to these reductions? Is there evidence that absenteeism interventions are successful? Which factors can be characterized as scalable and replicable? And what best practices and learning lessons have emerged? And so in sum, I think that focusing on lowering absenteeism has enormous potential. I think we all agree that kids being in school is a good thing and we'd rather have them in their seats than not in their seats. And in fact, these interventions to reduce absenteeism are strong. So they are at a 0.1 standard deviation. We don't need to go into what that means. But let's compare that to the class size interventions. In fact, there's a bill right now to provide more money to reduce class size. I don't know if you've gotten in the mail yet, but it's coming. Look at the size of these standard deviations. It's 0.05 to 0.2. And so reducing absenteeism falls right in there and could potentially be much less costly. But to do this, we can't be blind to the challenges in tracking absenteeism deciding who's responsible to reduce absences, and help us enlist our parents to partner to reduce absenteeism. Thank you.